again, I'm so grateful to get to uh, know some of you a little bit better and uh, learning about you and so forth. I so appreciate your faith, appreciate your commitment to the Lord and you being here today. And again, I do want to say something to those who are um, either live streaming it uh, with Zoom or watching it recorded. Uh, almost like a press conference here. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, whatever we can do to multiply the teaching of God's Word, isn't that great? And we need to uh, take advantage of those opportunities. But I want to say to those watching and listening, thank you. Um, and I know some of you have difficulties and you can't get out in the midst of this virus threat. And uh, it's important that you take care of yourself and you can participate this way. And you're to be commended uh, for participating this way. Uh, and we appreciate that. And all the men are having to work with the equipment. Thank you so much. That's a lot of work. Uh, analogies are interesting things. We use them all the time, even without thinking about them. Like we use expressions like he's as busy as a bee. Or she's as sharp as a knife. Talking about somebody who's a hard worker or somebody who's very, very intelligent. Um, I heard it say one time that uh, when somebody's indecisive, it's like a squirrel trying to cross the road. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? Uh, and this one hits a little close to home. A lie is like a bald spot. The bigger it is, the harder it is to cover it up. <laughs> I understand that. Well, they're all in the Bible, analogies. And they're carefully chosen by the Holy Spirit. If you believe that the writings of the Old and New Testament are inspired by the Spirit of God, then the words that are chosen, the verbally inspired expressions, all are on purpose. And the analogies are important to understanding the spiritual concept. And sometimes an, an, an analogy can be so powerful that it becomes part of the understanding of the definition. And the most common analogy for the church in the New Testament is so commonly used and so powerfully used that it's become synonymous with the church, and it should be. I want you to consider with me the statement made in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to spend our time in Ephesians 4, but I want you to start with me. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, where the Apostle Paul is writing about the great salvation and the blessings that come through Jesus Christ. And speaking of Christ, Ephesians 1, verse 22 says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We know that Jesus actually had a physical body on earth, came in the flesh. So we understand that whatever the church is here, that it's not literally his physical body that he had on earth. But note the expression. It doesn't say that it's like the church. Or rather it says all things to the church, which is his body. It's an analogy. But it's an analogy that is so powerfully used that when you think of church, you should think of body. Now, when we read the word church in the Bible, sometimes it means, in a generic sense, everybody who belongs to Christ. All believers everywhere of all time. Sometimes called the universal church. You could also call it the eternal church. Because when everything's said and done and the Son, according to 1 Corinthians 15, delivers the kingdom up to the Father, that's going to be the collection of all of the saved people. Thus, the universal eternal church. But when you read in a, in a sort of rubber meets the road kind of way about how church works in the New Testament, it's usually talking about a local body of believers. Like there's a church, a letter written to the church at Corinth. So we see that church refers to sometimes a group of Christians in a location. And that's really the practical dimension of what we're going to read about in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. So read with me about the living, healthy, growing body of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, and I've got this on the screen. I hope it's big enough. You never know when you're visiting somewhere how things are projected. I think that's okay. But I want to start in verse 7. That says in Ephesians 4, but grace was given to each one of us according.
according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then it quotes from the Old Testament and it talks about how that Christ, he came down to the earth, but he also went back to heaven. He ascended and when he did that, he gave gifts. So skip down with me to verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. For building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head unto Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In the first chapter, Paul introduces the idea that the church is the body, and here he elaborates by saying more about the body and the workings of the body. And when he talks about the church here, he's really talking about two specific things. To understand what church is, and this is a great text for doing that, it's about a relationship and it's about a purpose. And you've got to have both. It's not just any kind of relationship. It's a certain kind of relationship with certain people who have a certain purpose. They're both necessary. And we see it explained here for us. It's the body of Christ. These are the people connected to Christ. They believe in Christ. They belong to Christ. They're his saved people. They're his called out, which is what church means in the Greek. A called out group. It's his people. But we have here also in Ephesians 4 a description of why they are his people. Why they are his body. They're in this body. They are his people for the purpose of growing to be like him. And growing in him. Okay. So I want you to look at this. This is a very simple thing as far as an idea. Church is simple. This is what it is. Now there are challenges in the relationship in the church. Challenges we have with serving Christ, challenges we have in a relationship with each other. And sometimes there are obstacles and problems in carrying out that purpose, and trials we face, and, and struggles we face, fulfilling the purpose of Christ's church. But this is really a pretty simple thing. Humans have made church complex. But in the New Testament, it's a pretty simple thing. And it has to do with being connected to Christ. And because I'm in a relationship with Christ, I'm in a relationship and thus I'm connected to the others who are connected to Christ as if we're all parts of a body. We're all one unit. And the reason we're in this body is so that the body can be built up. So that we all are built up or we all grow to the extent of becoming like Christ. What's the goal? To the measure, to the stature of Christ. So, you know, Daryl over here is a pretty good sized guy, tall. I'm sure his son wants to be that tall one day. I'm sure he looks up at his dad and, and hopes one day he'll be as tall as his dad. And maybe he will be, maybe he'll be taller. And you can really be even basketball then. <laughs> There's this natural aspiration to be as tall as your dad or as tall as your mom, to grow up to be their sons. This text is teaching us that the natural aspiration, the purpose of a Christian is to grow up to be like Christ. And all of us collectively are trying to grow and thus trying to help each other grow to be like Christ. That's church. It's no more complex than that. Everything centers around that. There are more things involved in it than just that. More particulars, but that's it. That's as simple as as it gets, it's no more complex than that. 
This is our working definition of what church is. Church is not a place. It's not a place. It's not a structure. That's actually a fairly common expression that people use. But that's not what it is biblically. Uh, a great question is this. What if you lost, what if a church lost its meeting place? Burned to the ground, swept away in a flood. What would happen? What would you do? It really should not fundamentally affect who you are and what your purpose is. It's a good question. Because it really is not part of the definition. It's also not an organization with which just to be affiliated. Like somehow you're an official member and you sort of drop in every now and then and make a financial contribution every now and then. Sort of like a spectator in the stands that you're just, you know, affiliated with it and you're just watching it. Matter of fact, the church is not like any other human group or any group relationship. I know sometimes it's easy to want to find parallels between, you know, the church and other things, but it's not those things. The church is not a business. The church's job is not to make money. You know what a church should do with its money? Spend it. Every single dollar. And there's a wise way to do it. But there is nothing to be gained that when the Lord comes back and a church says, look at us, Lord, we've got $100,000 saved. You know the parable of the talents? Matthew 25. It's not a school. It's not a medical clinic. It's not the Red Cross. Why? Because those things have different relationships and different purposes. The church is uniquely the people who belong to Christ. And the church uniquely have the goal. They should have the purpose. It should have the purpose of growing to be like Christ. None of those other things have that relationship and have that purpose. Um, once read about a story about this church in Georgia that they were needing to, uh, it's a denominational church, they were needing to raise a little money so they started selling chicken dinners on the side. Well, they evidently had a really good recipe and the chicken dinners carried very well, but then the church eventually sort of diminished and they stopped meeting as a church and now it's, it's just a business and it, it existed for years. It was called the Church of God Grill. And they just got to the point where they stopped being a church but the chicken sort of caught on, and so they just kept the name Church of God Grew. See, their purpose became something different. And so this is, a, this is why we need to stick to biblical analogies. The Holy Spirit picked this analogy on purpose. It shapes our concept. And when you start thinking of things like a business or a school or, a, or something like that, and you think of the church need, needing to be like that, and listen, there are so many talents people have in their occupations and in their trainings and experiences in life. And sometimes they can bring those into the work of the church and they can be beneficial. I mean, where would a lot of churches be today without some computer guys, right? Look at this opportunity we have and these guys have to have some skills in that. But there is nothing that completely translates from the business world or the education world or the medical world into the church. It's something completely different. It's on a different planet. Why? Because of the relationship and because of the purposes. So look more closely after this definition of the body. Look at how the body works. Look at the dynamic of the relationship. First of all, for his body, Christ gave gifts. These gifts he's talking about here are not gifts like we think of gifts that are tokens of appreciation of someone or tokens of affection. You may give somebody flowers. You may give somebody, you know, a fishing rod or a power tool. You may give someone perfume or something like that. No. Mm -hmm. This is like a, a dad with a couple of teenage boys and on Saturday morning he drags them out of the bed at 9 o'clock and he brings them to the garage and he says, there's the mower, there's the gasoline, there's the trimmer, there's the blower. 
These are my gifts to you. Do the art. That's what we're talking about here. These are the things that Christ has given to the church for the church to fulfill its relationship and its purpose. There are the apostles and prophets that are mentioned here. We learn about what their role was in the New Testament. They were guided by the Holy Spirit, and they were, it was proved that they were guided by the Holy Spirit by the signs and wonders and miracles that they could perform by power of the Holy Spirit. The work of the apostles and prophets, it's been completed. The role of the apostles and prophets are no more. But the fruit of their work we have in the revelation of the New Testament. Matter of fact, this book, Ephesians, says over in chapter 2, verse 20, that this temple of the Lord is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Why? Because they were the ones that Christ used to deliver his gospel and to communicate his revelation. But what are the other gifts? There are shepherds. You see that when you look at that reference in the New Testament regarding the church, that it is parallel to, it's describing the same work and office of elder and overseer. Shepherds or elders or overseers. It's all the same work, all the same place, it's position. But this term shepherd, look at it here. It's one who guides, it's one who protects, it's one who feeds. It's one who assists those and protects those. And then there are teachers who instruct in the word, and then there are evangelists. Evangelist means one who announces the news or even announces the good news. We think of an evangelist working with the lost to proclaim to them the gospel. But here it says the evangelists were given to the church, to the body. So there is some way in which the evangelist also helps in announcing the good news the church itself to complete its work. And it's in the next couple of verses that we see what this is about. In verses 12 and 13. Why are these gifts given? The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. To, verse 12, equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. These evangelists and shepherds and teachers do not do all the work. They are not solely responsible for the service or the ministry of the body, but rather they aid the different parts of the body in carrying out the ministry. Ministry there is in service. <coughs> You see that concept that teachers, shepherds, evangelists are there so that everybody does work. They aid them in doing the work. It's sort of like the veins and the arteries. The veins and the arteries work between the heart and the lungs. The veins and arteries are everywhere in the body. But let's just think about the veins and the arteries regarding the heart and the lungs. The veins and the arteries carry oxygen from the lungs to the heart to be pumped in the rest of the body and picks up that carbon dioxide coming from the rest of the body. It's coming through that chamber in the heart, brings it back into the lungs, and it's expelled. And we have to have that as a, as a human being. We've got to be taking in the oxygen, releasing that carbon dioxide. And the lungs and the heart are critical in that. They've got to do their work, but the veins and the arteries facilitate that work. This is how the church is meant to work. All the saints do the work. The shepherds, the teachers, the evangelists help to facilitate them, help them to do the work. Ultimately, that's how the body grows. And look what else it says. Every joint supplies, or every part of the body supplies, talks about this here. In verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We get this analogy with the human body, right? We know that human, the human body is made up of different parts that do different things. The kidneys have their unique function, their lungs, the nervous system. 
the digestive system, and then parts of the digestive system, the esophagus, the stomach, the intestines, on and on. We, we understand this when it comes to the human body, that every part has a unique contribution, and all the parts have to be contributing. But do we see this regarding the church, the body of Christ? Or do we see somehow that the church is this collection of people, but then there is this group of people in the church who's like, a, you know, sort of an elite clientele. And they're instrumental. And they're the ones that really get it done. Maybe elders, teachers, preachers, maybe people who are the longest tenure in the congregation, maybe somebody who's got a lot of money. They're the cogs. And everybody else is just sort of peripheral. They're not vital. It's not what the New Testament teaches. It's not at all what it teaches. So what is necessary for all the parts to supply so the body can be built up? So you can think about four things. First of all, every part of the body has to be accepted. The New Testament teaches what makes a Christian. And in a fellowship of a local church, you've you got to make a decision, okay, is this person following Christ? Have they obeyed his gospel? Have they put Christ on? Are they a Christian according to what the New Testament says? If they are, that's it. That's nothing else for us. Now, if they've not, it doesn't matter how nice they are. It doesn't matter how much we like them. It doesn't matter how wonderful their company is. None of that matters. They're not part of us. But if they become a Christian, they are. Doesn't matter what their personality is like. Doesn't matter how they dress. Doesn't matter what kind of job they have, how much education they have, how much money they have. Doesn't matter what their background is, who their parents were. Doesn't matter what kind of social status they have. None of that matters. If they're a Christian, they're part of us. That's all that matters. Our society is really grappling right now with racism. And as Christians, we need to grapple with it. We need to think about it. We need to deal with it. We do. Because you know what one of the biggest obstacles in the New Testament was to the spread of the gospel? Racism. <clears throat> Jewish Christians having difficulty accepting Gentiles as true Christians without becoming Jewish. And you may think, well, there's a religious dimension to it. Yeah, there was. There's also a racial dimension to it. Racism is an age-old human problem. It's not an American problem. It's a human problem. And racism is an obstacle to the gospel. And all that matters about a person is if they're a Christian or not. Souls don't have color. Souls don't have nationality. Souls don't have ethnicity. And the New Testament is pretty plain on this. Statements like Colossians 3. that talks about a person who's become a Christian. It says in Colossians 3 verse 10. And have put on the new self. That's all that matters. As a person put on the new self. Become a Christian. Which is being renewed in the knowledge. After the image of its creator. Here, there. Here, here. In Christ. There is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all in all. I don't know your complete background ethnically and racially, but I can make a pretty safe guess. Most of us are in this right here. Gentile or most of us are barbarian, by the way. Most of us, our ancestors were the barbarians. You think, well, that sounds like a negative term. Yeah, that's where it was back then, too. It was not officially at first, but, yeah, Northern Europeans were the barbarians, and that's the ethnicity of most of the people I look around and see right here. What this is saying is, if you're in Christ, none of that matters. It's just an example. But in order for all the parts to work, every part has to be accepted, and nothing can get in the way of that acceptance. Every part needs to be valued. How do you 
value people in the body? Well, it starts with getting to know them. If you don't know the names of other people in the congregation, if you don't know anything about them, there's no way you can really value them. You don't know how to value them. You've got to know your brethren. You need to listen to them. Understand them. You need to say what you appreciate about them. You need to praise them when there are things that need to be praised about them. You know, it's important when we read the New Testament that in our relationships in Christ, sometimes we have to correct and reprove and rebuke one another. Do you know when that's most effective? It's when it's built in a relationship that also involves appreciation and praise. Prime example of that is Paul. Aren't you stunned sometimes when you read some of Paul's letters how sharp those letters can get? But in other places, they're so loving and tender. Paul had a relationship with these people. Not every church he wrote to, he had a close relationship with. But many of them he did because he had showed that he valued them. So that when he had to say the hard things, he had influence. And not only does every part need to be accepted and every part needs to be valued, but every part needs to see that as a part of the body, I've got something to supply. I think a lot of people let themselves off the hook by saying, you know, I, there's not a whole lot I can do, you know. That's just an excuse. Don't think you don't have value in the body. Don't think you can't contribute. Some people say, well, you know, I can't get up, teach a class, or preach a sermon, or lead singing. That is so off the mark. It's almost comical it's so off the mark. First of all, it, it may reflect some negative things. First of all, it may reflect that we put too much emphasis on that stuff. Way too much. As if that's all that matters. Second of all, sometimes a church can be so dead, that's about the only thing it does. It gets together, has group singing, has group sermon, or Bible class. No wonder everybody thinks, well, if I can't do that, I can't do anything, because that's pretty much all the church does. No wonder people get the message. I can't do that, I can't do anything. But what are the first two points I made? What is necessary for the body parts to supply to the body for its growth? Accept everyone and value everyone. If you do that, your role is huge. You know what you are? You're glue. You're helping to glue people and cement people to the body. Sometime back, Lori and I had gone through a, a real challenging time, a real discouraging time. Uh, I, I never, I, I don't know, I almost felt like I didn't know what it was like to feel really discouraged. And I went through a period and I was really discouraged. And we happened to go visit some friends at a church. And it was in January, the dead of winter. And we get out of our car. And we're literally getting out of a car, and, I, and I'm getting my coat and picking up my Bible. We've never been to this church. We only, we're, we're only going to know two people in this church. And I look up, and here comes this lady across the parking lot. She comes across the parking lot in January. She comes across the parking lot, makes a beeline for me, and says, Hi, I'm Julie. And introduces herself and welcomes us. It had a lot to do with what I was facing at the time. It was huge to me. You know, never heard Julie teach a Bible class or lead singing or preach a sermon. Been in that church a lot. Never heard her get up and do any of that stuff. <coughs> but she's done at least as much as any preacher did or something. That's what you call showing that you value people. And you accept people. Every one of you can do that. Now, you know, I'm sort of a shy person. Guess what? You probably can be the best at it. 
There are some people who are just naturally gregarious. And it shows. But when somebody's quiet and they're a little bit shy, and they make the effort to go speak to someone and say, hello, who are you? I'm so-and-so. I'm glad you're here. Where are you from? What brings you our way? Come back and see us. People have these invisible antenna all the time. They're picking up signals. You know, you see a big tower, you see all these things hanging off of it. They're picking up signals. People are like that. They're picking up signals all the time. And people, when they encounter a shy person, they read them. An introvert or a shy person, they read them within a matter of just a minute or two. And they see that shy person just saying, hello, I'm glad you're here. It's huge. It's more valuable than any big mouth preacher coming up, you know, doing what they do. So valuable. Because it's showing appreciation and that, that person's important. And only do you see you need to do that, but every part needs to contribute. If you've not been contributing to the body, you're depriving it of strength and health. You're, you're making it less healthy than it can be. You have to find something to do. And, and listen, don't, don't think just in terms of physical things. Yeah, there are physical things that need to do. Daryl was sweeping up fireworks out here this morning. And I thought, what is he sweeping? That's very nice. Walk up and he was cleaning the fireworks up. You know, things like that have to be done. Okay? That's, that's great. We all have to do that. People have to set up the equipment and turn things. But don't just think that. Again, that means the building is the body. And it's not. Not even close to being the body biblically. What are you doing for people? What are you doing to help people grow to be like Christ? What are you doing to help people be spiritually stronger? How can you help people? Is your view of the church a vending machine? There's just the right buttons you push and then you get the thing out of it that you want. The church is there so I can bring, you know, all my problems and all my needs and all my requests. This is what the church should be doing. The church should be doing this and the church should be doing that. You know, really the first question is what should you be doing? You've heard the old fable, you know, about the village that was, they were running out of food. They were starving, right? Remember the, the fable about the stew? And somebody says, well, you know, I've got a, I got a little beef broth. And someone says, oh, I've got a couple carrots. Somebody says, i got a couple potatoes. Somebody says, I've got some celery. And somebody says, I have a, a little slice of beef. And somebody says, I've got this and that. And they put it all together. The next thing you know, they got the stew. And everybody gets a nice bowl of it. You only can really take out strength from the body. And people are putting it in. Every part needs to contribute. That's what Christ wants in his body. And to what end? Look what it says here at the very end of that last statement there in Ephesians 4. That last statement in verse 16. It says, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up. In love. We're building up to the point of being like Christ, but the atmosphere of growing to be like Christ is in love. And that's that acceptance piece. That love means that there are no conditions, that we have an unselfish concern for others regardless. It, it's, it's really depicting here. Something like a, a nursery. You know, you, you arrange a nursery in your home or maybe some other location because you put just the right things in there because that will facilitate the care of that baby. Or it's like an incubator. An incubator is designed in such a way that the air coming into it and it's warm and all those things so that the baby, or in some cases you can use them for like animals, so the animal can get through the growth stage to get healthy. It's like a, the body is to be this incubator of love. Not in some kind of mushy thing where everybody's just all mushy with each other kind of love. We're talking about real love. We're talking about Christ on the cross love. 
We're talking about unselfish concern for other people. This sometimes has an edge to it. Sometimes you have to say strong things. But it's love because you want that person to grow in Christ. Here's a question. Do you want to see every one of the people sitting in this room? Do you want to see every one of them grow in Christ and go to heaven to live with him? Do you have some kind of hesitancy about that? Like, well, that person over there, it's not looking very good for them. I don't know if they're going to make it or not. Our job is not to judge. Our job is to try to build this incubator of love so we all have an opportunity. The person may not take advantage of the opportunity. May not. So there's an opportunity to be built up in Christ. The body of Christ has to be an atmosphere of people pulling for each other, supporting one another, being patient with each other, encouraging one another. On the same side. Pulling in the same direction. Going in the same direction. There could be a hundred different reasons why a local church does not see very many conversions. It's possible for a church to be what the body of Christ needs to be and people don't follow Christ. They don't want to obey his call. That's possible. We find people all through the New Testament who turn their back on Christ it happens. We also know, especially from the book of Acts, that when it comes to people being converted, it is people who have an open heart, who are hungry for the gospel, who are humble enough to receive it, and all those kinds of things. But we know from the book of Acts that God's providence is a major factor. He lines things up in such a way for people to learn the gospel. Philip is called to go down this road, and then he runs right into this guy who's reading from Isaiah, what we would call Isaiah 53, who's been to Jerusalem to worship, who has spent a lot of time and money searching God, and here he is ready for someone to guide him. I mean, that eunuch of Ethiopia riding in that chariot, he's the evangelist dream. I wish I could find a guy like that every day. How did that happen? God's providence brought them together. Paul and Silas were thrown into a prison in Philippi in Acts 16. The earthquake hits. The jailer runs in. He's talking about a, a chance meeting. It's not chance, it's providence. And they teach him the gospel because he's open to it. He and his household. So here's the question. Do you think that God will send a precious soul who needs to be saved and nurtured and taught and encouraged into an atmosphere where they're not welcome? They're not accepted. And they're not. Welcome. What do you do then? It has been great being together on this first day of the week. And we all understand that on this first day of the week, our focus has been on Christ. And how he sacrificed his body and poured out his blood. To us, we ponder this day, the body of Christ that hung on the cross. It was offered as a sacrifice to make the payment for our sins. That flesh was treated in such a brutal fashion. He endured unbelievable suffering. And to us, that body is so cherished. We honor the body of Jesus. But after Jesus gave his body, on the cross for our salvation. 
he then formed his body. The extension of himself. Those who would believe upon him and turn to him for salvation and then in communion with him, be attached to him and become like part of him and grow to be like him. His body is now the believers around us. These are the precious parts and joints and members of his body. And now what does he want? He doesn't want that body brutalized. He doesn't want it harmed. He wants it to live and thrive. He wants it to live and grow in health. And we're privileged to be in that body. But attached we are to him and one another. And it's a very simple thing. But it's everything. This connection we have one with another because of Christ carries with it this great responsibility. Our role, our purpose is to help one another grow in Christ. And when we all contribute to that, we all grow in Christ. We're all built up. And we become complete in Christ. The body of Christ, it is such a precious body. Am I treating it that way? Well, my wife and I were walking the other day, and um, you know, when you're a preacher and you marry a preacher's daughter, you're going to get schooled. And she told me, you know, that 2.30 service, you need to preach a short lesson. And she was right, so I try to keep it reasonable here today. And she's exactly right. Because it's hard to come back real quickly after you ate and all that. And I'm just amazed at how well you've listened. Thank you so much. You've listened with such attentive ears, and crisp minds, and open hearts. And God bless you for that. If there's a soul here who's not a Christian, you're missing everything. Will you come to Christ? You answer the call of the gospel and repent of your sins and confess you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Be baptized into Him and become part of His body and be blessed to grow, become more like Him. If you're ready to avail yourself of that opportunity, we encourage you to respond as we stand together and sing.